Ship crewman, what was the creepiest experience you had out on the ocean? Like and subscribe or I'll haunt you tonight. Not saw, but heard. Well, that's not entirely true, another crew member did claim he saw another boat right around sunset, but I never saw it. Anyway, I'm alone on the bridge of this private yacht I worked on. I wanted the bridge time and the only time to get it was at night as I was the new guy. So I'm on the bridge alone and I'm messing with the radio just out of boredom. All of a sudden, I hear a little girl's voice asking if there's anyone out there. I respond normally, ask if she needs anything. I'm assuming she's playing with dad's radio. She says she hasn't heard from anyone in a really long time. Says she's been at sea for what seems like forever. I ask her if she's with her family, and she says they're here, but they won't talk to her anymore. She says they're all, and this really creeped me out, all getting really angry and screaming at each other all the time. I ask the name of her boat and she tells me the name of a ship I knew to have sunk six years ago in the same area. I'm really creeped out now, considering waking someone up. I asked her if she needs anything, and her reply still haunts me. She says, I need about 350. US Marine here, during a float on a boat to operation, top secret, destination, unknown, one of our own were lost at sea. I guess they just jumped overboard at night or something. Kinda depressing, that's a stupid way to die. Anyways, their coffin rack was adjacent to mine, and we left the rack made, and for some reason, the sheets kept on getting messed up every day. It was pain in the ass to keep making the sheets we stripped the rack. And we figured that no one should be sleeping in there since there were plenty of other vacant racks in the berthing. But someone would keep making the rack, and messing the sheets up in the morning. I know aircraft carriers are big, but could someone really fake their own death on one and get away with it? There's no way someone would be sleeping there, because we'd notice someone climbing up on the top bunk, and the duty would have been posted at the entrances to the berthing. It was just creepy seeing the rack being made neatly and then messed up in the morning. Not ship crew, but one of three guys sailing a 45-foot Morgan from Antigua to Daytona Beach, Florida. I had zero crossing experience prior to this trip. Anyhow, I pictured getting tan, pina coladas and white sand beaches, nope. It was open ocean, at least by landlubber standards, and three-hour shifts round the clock manning the helm, GPS and radar while the other two guys chilled during the day or slept at night. It was hard as hell, and I've done a few things considered somewhat tough and out of the ordinary. The biggest worry while on autopilot are the bazillions of ships flying around throughout the Caribbean. Yes, you can see them from many miles away, especially at night and with the help of radar, but they sneak up on you and a 600-foot freighter captain by a possibly hammered crewman in the wheelhouse at 2 in the morning wouldn't even feel a bump as it split us into kindling. So, one night I'm on shift, trying to stay awake with Snickers and coffee, and it's so black you couldn't discern the horizon line. Just stars, blackness, and the running lights of lots of far-off freighters going in all directions. I proceed to take my occasional 360-degree glance around like I was told to make sure there's also nothing coming up aft, and oh my god, there's this giant round yellow light stretching what seemed like across the entire sky directly behind me. Clearly, this was a freighter directly behind our boat with some kind of a spotlight on the bow trained on us and about to gobble us up like Jonah. The rush of terror was so great, I couldn't even stomp on the deck to awaken my mates let alone scream for help. So, I just accepted my impending death and wondered if it would be the impact or drowning that killed me first. Then I focused a little harder and realized it wasn't a ship at all. It was a full moon rising, I can't describe the immediate relief. It was like awaking from the most terrifying dream you've ever had and realizing. Holy smokes, I'm not running from Freddy Krueger, I'm in my bed. Sailing a crossing like that I learned is hours and hours and sometimes days and days of endless boredom punctuated with short periods of Defone 10. I don't know if this was creepy exactly, but it sure scared us. Up by Alaska in rough seas. Our office was below the waterline, on the outside of the ship, right below a sponson. There was a full-size I-beam running around the outside edge of the office. It was probably 10 inches wide and we used it as a shelf, storing full-size binders on it. One day in rough weather, six of us were in the office, three officers, three enlisted, when we heard an enormous bang, so loud that our ears rang and all of us jumped out of our seats. 
After checking to make sure we weren't taking on water, and calling damage control, we started looking around to determine what could have caused it. We couldn't find anything, nothing had come loose, nothing had fallen, the dry tank below the office was still dry, etc. We eventually noticed that the I-beam had cracked. Not a hairline fracture, not a little split, but the entire beam had separated lengthwise by about 5 millimeters. We took a wave up under the sponson with so much energy that it bowed in the hull of the ship and split the beam, but the beam did never go back to the original length. The crack was also precise and even, you could slide a pencil in the gap all the way back to the bulkhead. In fact, the split was so wide, they couldn't weld it directly closed. They had to cut a 5mm shim to fill the gap. It was amazing, and we had hundreds of people come through the office for the next couple of weeks to see it. A couple of people tried to calculate the energy needed to instantly separate the I-beam that was 4 feet away from where we were sitting, but it was too scary to contemplate. That's my creepy story, hope you enjoyed. A friend, a captain, asked me to help deliver a sailboat from Fort Lauderdale to Houston. I was a somewhat inexperienced sailor, only sailed for fun a few times, short trips. But he was able to get me $100 a day so I said why not, I was between jobs. It was three of us, me, my captain, who was a very experienced sailor, and the new owner of the ship. Once we got to Anna Maria Island on the west coast of Florida, we prepared for the longest haul of our trip, the first time we'll be away from the coast going through the Gulf of Mexico. We did a four-hour shift, then you'd get to sleep or do whatever for eight hours until your next four hours. The eerie part for me was my shift, alone, pitch black darkness in the middle of the ocean, no moon out. You also have to avoid a lot small oil rigs, some still active, some not active, some marked with lights, some not. You'd hear explainable sounds etc, I don't know if it was just my head messing with me, but that one overnight shift was pretty tense and scary for me. Towards the end of my shift, we hit some pretty bad rain and rough seas. My captain took over, I went to bed. I get woken up a bit later to crazy rough seas. I go back on deck, and my captain and the owner of the ship just yell, we have to turn back, we lost our GPS. Apparently, the wind knocked it off the top of the mast and into the ocean. So there we are now, rough seas, pitch black and with no GPS. Luckily, my captain is old school and knows how to sail with just a chart, so we made it back to Anna Maria and purchased a new GPS. The whole event was just surreal and I was definitely worried a few times. The rest of the trip was uneventful, the next nights had nice bright moons, calm seas and that made it a little less eerie. I sail on tall ships, with temp crews of young people, 16 to 18 usually. We discourage ghost or creepy stories because there's always some kid who gets inspired and takes it too far, and between rig climbing and weather and the general danger of being at sea, we really don't want that. So no outright creepy stuff, but the sea can be plenty eerie. Being in thick fog and hearing sounds that seem close by, but usually aren't, can be pretty chilling. Buoys that have sound signals can sound spooky as hell. The way the eye tries to make sense of distances when the sea is mostly flat can be really alarming. Look out, I thought that thing was a mile off and now it is at our bow. Then there is the time we were in the middle of the Atlantic and the main anchor started letting out just after I came off evening watch. I dashed out of the mess and onto the foredeck to ram on the brakes, which turned out later to be about 2 to 3 seconds before the anchor and chain combined would have been too heavy to haul back in. We had been pounding in an 8 meter swell for days, so I assumed the brakes and the slip must have just rattled loose in the relentless motion. But the bosun swore up and down that he double secured the slip with rope, and that there was no way it could have come loose on its own. I was sailing as a cadet on a 1000 foot plus container ship crossing the Atlantic during the middle of winter leaving the Mediterranean heading to Halifax. We were in 40 to 50 foot seas. I was sent to check the side port, a hatch on the side of the ship used for taking on stores or a pilot. Our sister ship had a case where her side port was leaking during rough seas. I went down 11 stories to the engine room and took the tunnel to the side port. The ship has two tunnels that run the length of the ship from the engine room at the stern all the way forward to the windlass at the bow. As I was in the tunnel, I looked all the way forward, nearly 1000 feet forward. I could see the ship twisting as we took each wave. Steel was moaning so loudly that it was extremely unnerving to a new mariner. What I saw in the side port was more unnerving. Every time we took a wave, water would rush through the cracks. Luckily, there was a bilge pump to take care of that. 
My job over the next few days was making sure the pump was keeping up. Me and two friends go down and rent a boat on Lake Okeechobee in Florida. We get a round 30 foot pontoon boat that has a cover although there's no cabin or anything under the main deck. It's winter in South Florida, so it's cool but not cold, thus we decide to just sleep on the boat instead of setting up a camp. We plan on spending three days and two nights on the lake. We spend our time drinking, fishing, and playing games. It's sometime on the second night when I just wake up. I'm still drunk from our previous activities, but my senses are on overdrive and I just feel aware of something. I was sleeping towards the back of the boat while my friends are at the front. It's eerily calm with no waves in the water. We were about 250 feet from shore with land on our port side. I started scanning the tree line looking for something. Nothing on land, so I scan the water on the port side. Nothing, so I scan the water aft of the boat. Nothing, I didn't want to disturb my friends up front, so I scan the water on the starboard side. That's when I saw it. A skull floating in the water with just the eye sockets and part of the nasal cavity sitting there in the water looking right at me about 50 feet away. An immediate sense of dread took me, it was the most scared I'd ever been in my life. Then an even worse feeling took over, calmness and the sudden urge to jump in the water. I had the notion that I would be at home and at peace if I just jumped into the water. Before I could act on it, I think one of my friends stirred in their sleep because I heard a beer bottle start rolling near the front of the boat. This snapped me out of it and the feeling of dread returned. I yelled at them to get up while I moved to start the engines. One doesn't respond at all while the other drunkenly tells me to get off. I yell again that I'm not kidding around and nothing. I'm about to pull the starter on the engine and yell again at my friends when I hear something. I freeze and listen closely, a very faint splashing sound that is slowly getting closer. I forget about yelling at my friends and focus on starting the engine. I pull and pull and pull on the starter and nothing. In between the pulls, I hear the splashing getting closer, but I don't dare look at the direction of the noise. Finally, the engine starts and I punch it out of there. I must have gone 30 miles before I came to a stop to conserve fuel. Until the sun rose and my friends woke up, I spent the rest of the night scanning the waters just in case. I had to make up a BS excuse to explain to my friends why we were so far away from our previous spot. I wanted to tell them, but I doubt they would believe me. When I got home, I did some research and apparently Native American tribes possibly use the lake as a burial ground plus there are thought to be the bodies of many victims of hurricanes throughout the decades laying in the lake. Fishermen have found many human bones over the years. This was over six years ago and I have yet to set foot near any body of water larger than my shower. No lakes, oceans, rivers, water parks, pools, hot tubs, nothing. I don't blame you if you don't believe some random guy on the internet. Many times I tried to write it off as my drunk self seeing things. However, I can't write off the feeling of wanting to jump into the water with something, real or not, that struck me with terror just a moment ago. Thinking about that feeling of wanting to go into the water with whatever was out there chills me to this day. I'm not a ship crewman. A buddy of mine is sailing the world and told a story about being adrift on glass smooth seas one evening. He could have turned on his outboard motor but, he was in no rush and fuel can get expensive, so he decided that he'd just wait for wind to eventually come back. So, moonless night, no wind, no waves, but there's a strange mechanical noise out in the ocean. There's no light so, he can't determine what it is and, his flashlight is completely useless. He considers that sound can travel a long long way over a glass smooth ocean, so he's not certain how far away this noise is. He starts considering that maybe it's a submarine and he wonders to himself if submarines ever surface under other boats. So, the day after he tells this story, I go to work. I worked with Navy at the time, so I retell his tale and ask, do submarines ever run into other boats out at sea? Oh yeah, happens all the time. Just Google submarine collision, it seldom means good things for the boat that got hit. Other people are joining the conversation to point out that, all those collisions you'll read about, Keep one thing in mind, they were all under power. They were making noise and we still just drove right through them. A sailboat? A drift? Buff. And, the ascent folk chiming in to mention that the transition between underwater and the surface is really noisy, so it's not like you can tell if something is right above you until it's really too late anyway. So, I told my buddy and sent him a link to the Wikipedia article about all these events. It didn't make him feel any better. 
I worked as an inspector on oil rigs, and we used ropes and harnesses to access the more difficult areas. I got sent with two other guys to do an inspection of a Pentagon rig in a bay in Argentina. It had been sitting there for a couple of years out of use. One of the cross tubular braces needed to be checked. It was a floatable brace, meaning that when the rig was ballasted down it would fill with seawater. It had an open hatchway on the underside with a small steel ladder attached. We abseiled down and managed to get in the hatch. The tubular was about 2 meters tall, so we switched on our head torches and started walking along the inside, moving our heads in circles to look for any problems in the torchlight. There's not much to see, the inside surface of the tubular is painted black, and at any time the torch only illuminates an area of a couple of feet. Then, about 30 meters in as I circle the light up above me, 6 inches away is a white skull with teeth staring down at me. I screamed and ran back towards the hatch, totally freaked out. Eventually, we get brave enough to investigate. The skull is that of a seal, in fact its whole skeleton is there, stuck to the ceiling. We worked out it must have swum inside years ago as the rig was submerging, failed to find its way out and drowned. Then stuck to the roof underwater as it rotted. Finally, once the rig rose and the water drained out it dried but had stayed stuck there. Maybe not relevant, but here goes. In the Marines back in the 1980s, we had been at sea for only a few weeks. No problems, no food shortages, no worries, a great experience. For the infantry Marines on board the ship, the only problem was boredom. Boredom leads to frustration, and frustration leads to stupid decisions over small matters. I did not see this, but two bored, frustrated infantry personnel were in line for morning chow. A mess hall worker simply did his job by refilling the selection of those small, individual boxes of cereal. For some reason, the brand Lucky Charms had become the most coveted breakfast item in their infantry minds. When the cereal boxes were placed in view, one box of Lucky Charms was present, a fight ensued. More bored infantry marines joined in. Then more joined in, and a small riot had broken out for this one box of Lucky Charms. When clearer minds had broken up the fight, there was no victor as the cereal box had been destroyed, and its contents spewed across the floor. One of the marines thought he was the victor, as he was holding the largest piece of the destroyed box. Although smiling, he was covered in blood and missing an ear. When the shock wore off, and the adrenaline faded, I'm sure the smile left his face. For infantry marines on ship, boredom is the enemy. I did 20 years in the marines, and have more sea time than Popeye the sailor man, just an expression and that was the first story that popped into my head. P.S. I was never in the infantry. I was stationed on a ship for a year during my time in the U.S. Navy. Our first trip during my time there was from Norfolk, Virginia to the Mediterranean for six months. On the way back, we hit a huge storm. There were waves as big as a shopping center slamming into our little amphibious group. I was on what amounted to a mini carrier, so we were barely rocking. I was standing at an opening on the side of the ship, sheltered from the worst of the storm, watching the other two ships struggle to make headway, and sort of laughing about it because they looked like they were rocking much worse than we were. Suddenly, a monster wave hit the Barnstable County, a very small LST, about frigate-sized, right in the bow, and she disappeared for a good 15 seconds. All I could think was, I just watched the whole ship sink, all hands lost, oh dang. Then, out if nowhere. It just leapt out of the middle of the wave like a giant tusk primeval sea behemoth from a Sinbad movie. I just about jumped out of my skin. I live in West Michigan, right next to Lake Michigan, which is basically a freshwater ocean. Anyways, I was salmon fishing all by myself one morning and I hooked onto something in 150 feet plus of water. I set the hook and very quickly figured out that this wasn't a fish and instead a very large snag. It was coming in very slowly but I wasn't about to lose $100 worth of line and lure. A few days prior, there was a boat that sank in my area. No survivors of bodies had been found. And when I snagged this thing, it was only 80 feet down, I feared the worst. I concluded I was going to cut the line if I even seen a shape like a body. Sure enough, I see some dark mass coming up about the size of a body. But I kept pulling it in. Thankfully for my own sake, it was a stray net that had rotting salmon and trout in it that had cut loose from a Native American net. I picked up and left that day and didn't launch out of that area the rest of the summer as I couldn't stop thinking about what that could have been. Also while this was going on, I hooked a fish and pulled out a 12-pound king salmon, 
But I let it go because I didn't want to eat it while thinking about what it could have been eating recently. I worked on a cruise ship going from UK to Spain and back, cross-channel ferry really, but quite big at 37,000 tones, 2,500 passengers. We had a turnaround of about 4 hours in Bilbao, and at this time, I worked in the restaurant. And after we had cleaned up, they started hailing a passenger over the loudspeakers to disembark. I remember he had a slightly comical name like Passenger Peckham or Passenger Pickles or something. Then the managers came and told us to start searching our stations for him. Every bit of the ship was getting searched, and they kept hailing him and a searching right up until the outbound passengers started embarking. They even had a searching in little cupboards and in the fridges etc. Obviously passenger pickles had jumped off in the night into the cold Atlantic. So another time, we were heading off at night during the winter gales, and about 5 hours offshore around midnight, I finished my shift and headed off to a crafty little platform at the stern where I could toke my nightly reefer in peace. And I saw the massive bright ship spotlight scanning slowly and methodically back and forth across the waves. I guess this was for a jumper and sitting there slightly baked, I could imagine perhaps glimpsing a last sight of some poor doomed soul struggling in the chop and wake before disappearing off into the vast black expanse of the Atlantic. An office later confirmed the spotlights that night were for someone who had apparently jumped off a ship that had passed in the opposite direction.